Welcome back to Face the State. I'm Ariana Bennett. Thank you for staying with us. Well, when you think of clean energy, you likely think of solar, geothermal, and wind. But in the battle against climate change, some scientists and investors are looking back at a type of energy we don't always consider as clean. Now, nuclear energy has had a checkered past, but its future could be promising. Gary Duart and Bruce Marlowe with the U.S. Nuclear Energy Foundation are both here to talk about that. Thank you both so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. Yep. Okay, so we know that there are some negative connotations to nuclear energy when it comes up in conversation. Is that largely what you guys are trying to combat with your organization? Yes, it's uh, basically grassroots education. We think that there's a, a lot of information about nuclear passed around by uh, the nuclear companies. They have lobbyists and things like that in Washington, D.C. Uh, so they're relatively up to speed. But the grassroots citizens, uh, we think, are really left behind. And we, uh, that's what we're trying to, to resolve is to fill that gap between the engineers and the scientists and Joe Citizen, uh, who uh, would really be helpful if they had understood some basics about uh, nuclear technology. Now, the United States is still a lead producer of nuclear energy worldwide, um, and, and it still produces a good amount of energy here in comparison to other forms. You guys want to talk about how common it is? How common it is in America? Yeah. Okay, well, it's common throughout the, uh, throughout the world, right? Um, even though over the past few years it's been um, in a tough piece of business for nuclear energy, there's still nuclear power plants being built all over the world today and plans for many more to be built. In America, you know, we were planning to build around 400 nuclear power plants and about 104 of those actually got completed. And they've been running uh, for over 40 years, a lot of these plants, and they're extending some of the lifetimes to up to 60. So it's a large, at one point it was about 20% of our, our energy and about 95% of all the carbon-free energy. And is it not still there? Well, what happens is now we have, you know, well, the percentages are changing. We've lost a couple of nuclear power plants uh, for economic reasons that they've shut down because they're not economically viable. Um, everything has some subsidies, uh, costs are high. You know, it's important that there, people that work in nuclear power plants have high paying jobs. So they're, they're expensive to operate, right? This is a, it's a, it's a very important technology that we do the right thing with. So when we compare it to other forms of energy, what are the advantages of doing nuclear? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do with it, right? The, the advantage is that it runs 24 seven carbon free and it'll run for 60 to 80 years. So it's, it's got a long lifespan and it's uh, when when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing, the nuclear power plant's making energy. And uh, that, that's, it's, a, it's actually an incredibly good balancing tool for renewables. I mean, nuclear power works with renewables. It's another form of renewable energy, really. And so it's just, it's the bank, it's the battery that backs up these other forms of energy. Drawbacks, though, and obviously the number one drawback is is the waste that it produces, which is, I think, maybe why sometimes it gets left out of the conversation we're talking about traditionally clean energy. While it's not um, carbon footprint impactful, um, it does produce waste. So, so what's the argument for nuclear when we are still going to have to deal with waste storage? Well, we know technically that we can reduce the amount of waste storage by 96%. So theoretically, uh, we have uh, 77,000 metric tons that of uh, spent nuclear fuel. And that's the other connotation. People all call it nuclear waste, but it's really spent nuclear fuel. Because in the current day plants, we've only been able to utilize about 6% of that fuel. So it is still available there and it's extremely valuable providing we consider reprocessing it. And the reprocessing has always been an economic struggle. How do we develop the technology quick enough to reprocess at a competitive rate for standard uh, uranium uh, reprocessing and fuel assemblies? We're getting there better and better today. And the new design of the uh, advanced reactors, the molten salt reactors, uh, will be 
designed to be able to, to burn that type of spent fuel because they operate at higher temperatures. So we really, the, the safest way to look at it is that spent nuclear fuel is a tremendous asset that we should theoretically, in the word repository, is set aside as quickly as we can uh, safely and then plan to, to work on the design and, and reprocessing environment as we go down the road. Now, when we're talking about nuclear reactors that are being designed and developed now, how different are they from the ones that were designed and developed in the 1960s, for example? This, this, I'll make it really kind of easy to answer that question. When we designed the first nuclear power plants, um, there was a thing called a dial telephone, okay? Today we have iPhones, right? So just take that advancement in technology, plug it into the formula that you want to think about it. The same advancements have been going on in the nuclear power world. MIT, all the universities, they've never really stopped their programs. There's a lot of young millennial folks out there that are very excited about bringing on new style reactors and uh, cost effective reactors, uh, uh, you know, ones that have less um, byproduct and uh, they're, they're going down all sorts of different paths. There's people working on fusion and as opposed to fission where there is no byproduct, right? So if fusion power comes on, which is another form of nuclear use of nuclear energy, then there's no byproduct to deal with whatsoever. And it would be a carbon-free source and it could run for forever, really. What are the main roadblocks to developing better technology and, you know, building more reactors to supply more power? It's always economics. At the end of the day, it's all about what it's going to cost to do. And, and having a, a favorable, um, let's say, government, that the people are in behind it, that the government supports it, and then investors can get behind it because they know it's going to be a good thing to invest in. And so it just needs, that, that all has to kind of come together. There has to be a, de a desire and a demand to actually do something productive. And is that not happening right now? Oh, oh it is. Uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, the Chinese are building nuclear power plants as fast as they can construct them. They even have their own designs now, and they're starting to export those designs. South Africa is building, getting ready to build some new plants. India is getting ready to build new plants. In the Middle East, um, they're building um, uh, quite a large population of power plants just to desalinate water. Uh, I think on the books they have about 30 nuclear power plants for the primary use of the energy would be to clean water so that they can flood the desert and grow food. Wow. Because nuclear power plants can make electricity and they can make clean water. Wow. That's really interesting. All right. Well, in any discussion about this, we got to talk about safety. And obviously, people are going to think about you know, what happened in Fukushima, what happened on Three Mile Island, that sort of thing. Um, with any technology, there's going to be some kind of risk. So how do you make the argument that, that it's safe and that the benefits outweigh the potential risks? Gary? Well, the, uh, I, I think that what people don't realize is that we have made advances in the past 20 or 30 years in the nuclear plants that we have. Uh, the DOE and the NRC has been monitoring them and we go in and uh, they have figured ways to make things more efficient. The, uh, uh, in the older days, uh, the valves were, were run by electrical or pumps in, 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 in uh, situations like that. A lot of the designs today are gravity. They're operating on gravity, which if you have a power failure, it still works. So those kinds of improvements, the grassroots public don't know about, and it would be helpful for them to, to have an understanding that, that those types of improvements have uh, really accelerated the safety environment as well. And I think that's probably, we just have a few minutes left, but I do want to touch on this, probably part of the reason why there's so much opposition to the development of Yucca Mountain here in Nevada. So where do you guys stand on Yucca? Uh, again, in it, for my environment, and I've talked with uh, Bruce about this quite a bit, uh, it, it is a, a, a relatively highly technical environment, the, the Yucca Mountain study. And the problem is that the grassroots people have not really been exposed to it. 
this discussion has gone on with the companies that, that drilled the, the, uh, the, the main tunnel in the first place uh, and government and legislature in Washington, D.C., but the grassroots public uh, have not been sort of kept abreast of it. Initially, the intent from the federal government came, uh, came down uh, to Nevada and, and they uh, gave Nevada some, somewhere about $97 million. The purpose was to uh, cooperatively study the analysis of the project itself. But instead, the, the state environment uh, basically opposed the, uh, the technical studies that were going on. This is what sort of needs to be settled out, uh, sorted out, that uh, we, we have to look at it based on the science and engineering versus just the political opposition for the sake of political opposition and not in my backyard are not real good answers to that situation. Okay, well, we just have about 30 seconds. So if you have a last message or a takeaway you'd like the audience to get from it, now's your chance. Gary? Bruce? Okay. <laughs> well, I think that any time you want to study energy and water, uh, you have to take a look at everything that's out there, right? And you have to look at the, the upside and the downside to it all, whether it's coal or gas or wind or solar or nuclear. And, and they can all actually work together if you think of it as an integrated program as opposed to this or that. You really want to bring it all together. All right. Well, thank you both so much for your time. I thank sure you. appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. That is it for this episode of Face the State. But for more information or to see past episodes, you can just head to our website. That's ktvn.com. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll see you next week.